Hello, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Henk van den Heuvel. I would like to welcome you on this uh, webinar, which will be a clear and hands-on tutorial on transcribing interview data. So currently we have 66 attendees, as I see. So very welcome to everyone. This uh, indeed is a, say, a super Tuesday for this topic of uh, transcribing interview data. Um, we will now briefly introduce uh, ourselves. So as I said, my name is Henk van den Heuvel. I'm director for the Lan Center for Language and Speech Technology at Radboud University uh, in Nijmegen uh, and involved in uh, automatic speech recognition projects uh, and uh, many more uh, projects on language and speech technology. And the other speaker will be my name is Christoph Draxler from the University of Munich, from the phonetics department. I'm a, by education, I'm a computer scientist, but yeah, I ended up in the phonetics department a long time ago. And ever since then, I enjoyed going to the office every day. So it's an interesting topic working with speech. And we have come to, I've come to lead some projects and one of them you will see today. We have implemented this OH portal. We have a very good programmer here at our lab who did all the wonderful implementation. This is the perfect occasion to introduce him, Julian Pump, who did most of the implementation stuff. So it's a collaborative op uh, effort, but Hank and I will be presenting today. All right, thank you. Um, I will do some uh, managerial notes now. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. <clears throat> All participants will receive a link to the recording later today. And slides will be available. You can check your chat box for the link. So if you are on the dashboard, you will see here the attendee chat one. And there uh, links will be added for you to follow and to, to use during the workshop or to copy. Questions. You can put them in that very chat box. We'll put questions to the speakers at the end of the webinar. The idea is that I will give an introduction of say 10 minutes now, then Christoph will take over and tell you uh, say the main dish of the, uh, uh, the transcription portal. And then we have some 20 minutes left for question and answers, uh, which I will then collect during um, the uh, webinar. Um, uh, and post to uh, Christoph and myself. Uh, and then uh, after an hour altogether, we will, uh, we will close the meeting and get some final notes. All right, I hope this is clear for you. Um, then I go to the next slide. Uh, the prerequisites, if you want to uh, join uh, using the transcription portal uh, along with uh, Christoph's explanation, then you should make sure that you have an Edgerome account that works or a Claren account that you can log in to the uh, oral history transcription portal. Um, and there will be links to the audio sample files which will be presented to you in the attendee chat. Uh, and please use a Go Google Chrome browser. Now, if you um, if you uh, do not participate right now in, uh, in, 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 in the hands-on stuff, you can do this later. That's no problem, because Christoph will show you during this webinar how everything works and the flow through the transcription portal. So there's no need to do it now. You can also do it later. But if you would like to do it now, you can do it uh, simultaneously and try it out yourself. All right. Um, I think... I'll go to the next slide now. Let's see. Um, yeah, now it's time for some, well, let's say commercials, um, and, but not uh, quite arbitrary ones, uh, because uh, um, I would like to uh, introduce you to two uh, um, initiatives uh, which are relevant as background for this transcription uh, webinar. So the transcription webinar is uh, uh, given in the framework of the shock uh, project. Um, which is a European project uh, running until 2020, 2022 and uh, has a number of uh, objects, um, which uh, mainly is uh, to create um, uh, for social science in the humanities 
um, uh, uh, science open cloud, uh, the European open cloud uh, science, uh, and maximizing the reuse through open science and fair principles. It, this is about tools and data uh, for uh, social sciences and humanities to be uh, used and uh, used uh, between each other. So it's interconnecting these uh, disciplines and use them. The uh, expected uh, impact of this uh, project is indeed that we uh, do have the social sciences humanitously uh, seamlessly integrated into this one cloud and have an open marketplace where you can find all relevant tools to do your research uh, and uh, benefit from that. So we also do training within Shock, and this is exactly why Shock has organized this webinar. Um, um, and this one is then organized through uh, Liber. And the other organization uh, that is relevant here is Clarin. Uh, Clarin is the common language resources and technology infrastructure in, uh, in Europe. Um, it has an ERIC status since 2012, and it provides easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences to digital language data uh, and tools. And uh, the idea is this is all done through a single sign-on online environment where you can build your own pipelines and uh, work with data and relevant tools. And one of these relevant tools is indeed this uh, transcription portal, which has also been uh, funded and supported by uh, Clarin. Clarin is uh, situated in uh, many countries these days with a national uh, office, so to speak. Um, it has uh, 21 members in various uh, countries and three observers and a lot of centers, which can be data centers or knowledge centers. Um, uh, for uh, for example, the technical pillars of uh, Clarin are the federated identity, the persistent identifiers uh, for uh, for data and tools, sustainable repositories, flexible metadata, so that you can really describe your data uh, in full and uh, find it as well. Uh, apart from finding data, you, there's also content search um, through uh, search engines and uh, web service chaining. So the re uh, relation between Clarin and oral history is, uh, uh, I will explain right now. Um, oral history is a, is a branch of history which is really centered to the uh, oral tradition of uh, uh, events where people are interviewed to give their uh, idea and their opinion on uh, historic events, uh, which can be quite different from the official uh, history in books, for example. But they give a good idea of individual experiences and uh, emotions. So central in this whole process as an instrument are the interview data. And the way these are processed uh, in the oral historian's domain is similar to what many others do with the interview. So it's the interview preparation, and you interview, you transcribe it, um, uh, make a summary, interpret, uh, make an interpretation of it, and put it into context and write a paper uh, on your findings. Um, and this is a, a paradigm that, of course, is found with uh, uh, more or less uh, variations in, in many other disciplines as well. And exactly that was the idea that came up during a Claren workshop on oral history. I think it was at Oxford that uh, using linguistic uh, analysis tools can be very uh, relevant for oral historians uh, working on interview data. And one of the first um, requirements that people then you need is a transcription service using automatic speech transcription to uh, convert the audio material into text. And what we did was, um, as a follow-up, was a, a meeting, a workshop in Arezzo in uh, 2017, where we um, made such a proposal for a transcription uh, chain. So from audio, Unto uh, a proper transcription. And we asked uh, researchers and ICT experts on, on their comments. And as a result of that workshop, we set up this transcription portal at BUS in Munich. 
And this was the basis for a number of uh, follow-up uh, clearing workshops where this transcription portal was used and uh, uh, extensions for analysis were present presented as well. So the transcription chain briefly looks like this. Uh, first of all, there's uh, analog to digital conversion. So if you have a tape, an analog tape, should be made digital first. And um, this is not really part of uh, the uh, services that we offer, but there is much information about on how to do this uh, on the link that uh, I uh, show you here. Uh, then there's automatic speech recognition. Um, uh, because you have to get to a transcription, you can use automatic speech recognition for that or transcribe from scratch by hand, of course. Uh, the other way is to use automatic speech transcription and then correct the uh, output to get to the proper transcription. And then again, you can synchronize audio and uh, transcription again. And of course, relevant for your uh, material is also metadata, which is now not really in full contained in the transcription portal as we will present it today. Uh, target groups for um, the use of these uh, services of the transcription portal um, started with historians and social science users, um, linguists and software tool specialists, um, but then the uh, scope of, uh, and, uh, of the participants extended and became larger and larger and increased to computational linguists, social linguists, social sign processing scholars. And in our last workshop, which was in, Uni in, in Utrecht, uh, we also had psychology um, uh, scholars, uh, psycholinguists and mental health studies who were very interested in uh, the transcription uh, portal because they use interviews as an instrument for their research. And of course, then you can think of many others uh, like law sc scholars, social economists, empirical religion scholars you're also using uh, interviews and pharma medical scientists. Well, in short, everyone using interviews in their work. Um, so for that reason, uh, there's a first occasion to use the attendance uh, chat uh, in your uh, dashboard because we are interested in your academic background and uh, the location where you work, so the, the country and, and, and the, the city. So if you would um, put that into the attendee chat, you would make us very happy. So the academic discipline uh, that you work in and the location where you are from um, so I think we go to the main dish uh, right now, um, and that is the uh, transcription uh, portal, for which I hand over to uh, Christoph. And if you have any questions, please put them in the attendee chat. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Henk. I think people now know where we are and what we try to uh, achieve. I will give a short overview of what I will be presenting. So it's about the transcription chain and automating this transcription chain in a web portal. First, since we saw a number of different uh, scholars or different fields of research interested in transcription, we will have a first look at transcription so that we know what different people need. Then I will go over the transcription chain once again and show you which part of it is part of the OH portal. I will then demo the OH portal and talk a little bit about the recommended workflow. So quite a classical setup. This is one of the parts where things tend to become difficult. Everybody wants automatic transcription, ASR, automatic speech recognition. But we really have to look at what different people need in terms of transcription quality. What types of transcript do they need? So I have here four different types of transcript. They're very primitive. I didn't do very much markup or anything, but just to show you how these diff what these different transcripts look like, and how we can arrive at them. Then I will compare in two cases the actual performance of speech recognition. So I call this man versus machine because we need something very illustrative. So first it's an interview by a British general and it's been 
uh, recognized by the Google ASR. And then since I had a web run, uh, a test run on this webinar, I recorded myself. And that's the man versus machine number two. And you will see that there are very big differences in terms of ASR quality. No markup yet, it's just the ASR quality. So first, this will lead us to the question, how can we get useful results out of automatic speech recognition in the first place? That will be the part, for, part before I actually go to the OH portal, just to raise your awareness that although we automate parts of the process, there is still very much to do in terms of manual processing. Don't expect miracles here unfortunately. So if you look at this transcript, it's a bit difficult to read because there are no, there's no punctuation or everything, but it's what I would call a raw text transcript. It's actually a text transcript of the file thompson01.waf, that's part of the downloadable files. It's about two and a half minutes of audio and when you read this, you very easily lose track of what's going on. Uh, why do we need such transcripts? Yes, if you want to compute the, rare, uh, the raw processing power or the uh, raw word error rate from speech recognition, then you need some kind of a normalized way of writing text. So you remove punctuations, you remove uh, words with, uh, you, you remove asterisks and, asterisks and so on. So to normalize the text and to compare it to different uh, ASR engine outputs. So basically this is not what people will use to read, but this is for automatic comparison of results. I think this is what people would like to see in the first place. So it's a diarization. So what we see is speaker one, speaker two. My um, argument for useful history is what the first person says and the other one simply back channels and says, yeah. And then the other one switches to the main topic, okay now, and so on. So there's an interchange going on, interaction going on during the interview. Hopefully, of course, it's the main speaker who's doing most of the talking. Unfortunately, in many his interviews, this is not the case. So this is a point where we have to make sure that we know what people are doing and where we have to also train our interviewers to achieve yeah, trans interviews that can be transcribed automatically. So why do we need this type of transcript? Here we can easily extract the individual speaker's uh, contribution to the dialogue or to the interview. We need it for content analysis and uh, it's the basis for any in-depth analysis. Okay, so this is, I think, what we would all like to have. Then, of course, enter the researchers, the scholars. They would now like to add some markup to highlight the parts which are interesting, either in terms of content, in terms of speaking style, in terms of emotion, and so on. In this case, I added some very, very simple marks. So the F would be a filled pause, something like er, um, and so on, because I'm not interested in the actual different forms of this these filled pauses. I just want to need, know there is something. Then I have the, oh, you don't see it now, underneath the, the gray box, there's a knee geo, a named entity for geography, because they're talking about the Fal Falklands War. And then there is a NE bib, so that would be a named entity from a biblical content uh, context, so that's Moses, the tablets of stone brought, brought down by Moses. So this kind of tags will be added during the more detailed analysis. Then there's, a, if you look a little further, there's the one bit P097, P046, F and P096. This is of course very interesting for discourse analysis people. Apparently the speaker, yeah, had to make up his mind of what he wanted to say. So there's a pause of almost one second then there's a single word too, half a second, then some er, um, and something, and yet again another second. So I think this is some kind of a turning point in the interview. 
which if you don't have the signal and only the transcript might easily get lost. If you look at the transcript on the slide before, you would only see two and a pause and place the writers and so on. But here you see there's something in the signal that tells us there is interesting information here. And of course, there's a lot of back channeling. So the meta talk without wishing to sort of bore you. So the interview we addresses the interviewer. This is not part of the actual content. So there's a lot to be identified in such dialogues or interviews and a lot to be marked up. And as you can imagine, this is very difficult to do automatically. So this is the work you will still have to do even if ASR has given you good results. Finally, there's something like a broad transcript. You don't always need the raw transcript. You don't need the diarization, Sometimes you just want to have, if you want to take a book out of your desk, uh, out of the shelf, or if you want to have a look at a cassette or some other short description, for example, in the library catalog, then this would be fully, fully sufficient. It gives you some key points from the presentation, uh, from the interview, maybe one or two key sentences, but the rest of it is simply summarized. And that gives you an impression of what people were talking about. And this will help you to decide, is this something I will have to look, and look at at all, or can I simply ignore it? So this is a very different type of transcript. We still call it a transcript because it contains key passages of a text, but it is very general. It's easy to read because we added punctuation, we added proper uh, lowercase and uppercase letters, so to make it really easy to read, to give you an idea what we're talking about, but without most of the details. Again, this is very difficult to do automatically. So I, I showed you four different types of transcript. They differ in terms of fidelity to what was said, the target audience. Not everybody is interested in all the information. In terms of reusability, so very often we get highly annotated transcripts of some interviews, but they have so many details in the transcription, in the annotation, that nobody else can use it or they use a proprietary uh, transcription schema nobody else knows. So there's a problem there. And they differ in terms of human expertise. Do humans have to do this type of work to get this type of transcript or can it be done automatically? And here's some maybe a bit uh, disappointing facts from practical work. If you don't have the signal, so very often people yes, actually throw away the signal after they've finished their transcription. You cannot add this information later on if you no longer have the signal. So if you have a broad transcript and you want to go to a more detailed one, you need the signal again. You need to listen to everything again, which makes it very time consuming. The converse is also true. If you have a very detailed transcript and reducing it to some broader kind of transcript may take as long as creating this uh, broader transcript directly from scratch. If you have a formally defined trans annotation scheme, then it might be easier. But practice, in practice, we very often find the case that people have or use transcription schemas that cannot be removed automatically from a text. And this means that removing these is just as takes just as much time as redoing the whole thing. So what I suggest and what I hope that we can achieve with automatic processing is that we get a raw transcript with speaker diarization so identifying who speaks when, with a time aligned uh, with time aligned words. And from this on, you can go in both directions, either in the direction of a broad transcript or in the direction of a more detailed transcript. But your reference should be this raw transcript. This is just one of the results of our daily work with this kind of recordings and transcriptions. OK. So I promised you two examples. 
we still haven't listened to these uh, interviews, but you will hear them in a minute. This is, on the left side, you see the manual transcript. On the right side, you see what Google ASR made out of it. Google ASR is a leading provider of speech recognition services, and it's a two and a half minute fragment. The manual transcript is about 1800 characters long, Google only 720. So apparently they didn't transcribe most of the speech. There is a measure called Levenstein distance, which measures the character based difference between two strings, how many edit operations are necessary to, to go from one string to the other, which in this case is a 1,075 is the value for the distance. And if we compare this to the, uh, relate this to the longer text, the reference text, which, which is the manual text, we have about a 60% error rate. So two out of three words are wrong. And I don't think this is a result that you would like to see in automatic speech recognition, but unfortunately this will happen. Of course, there are also other situations. This is my test run of the webinar. And again, it's a two and a half minute fragment. It's a bit longer because I had more to say. Uh, no, it's, a, it's longer, it's 10 minutes. So it's about 10 minutes. So I had 4,600 characters and Google recognized 4,604. So there's a very small difference in terms of characters. And if we look at how many characters have to replace, sub substituted or deleted to go from one uh, string to the other, we only need 248 of these operations, meaning that we have a 5.3% a error rate, which is actually quite good. So if we can achieve this kind of ASR result, I think that's what we can work with very well and it will reduce our work immensely. How do we get these? Hank said this in the when he cited the Wikipedia on oral history that we interview people and unfortunately very often we have to rely on what was recorded 20 or 30 years ago. So we might have some uh, yeah, bad media quality, cassette recordings and so on. But if we do recordings now, we should aim for a few, or we should take care of a few points and aim for maximum signal quality. The technical signal quality, all of the devices that we have available now are suitable for high quality recordings. I've put some recommendations here. They might not tell you too much now, but if you start using one of these devices, simply look up in the manual how you can set the sample rate to this high uh, number, how you can set it to wave format and so on. This will at least help you in getting the technical thing right. Much more important is the content side. So automatic speech recognition works well on topics that it has been trained on. So if we talk about historical facts, historical data, perhaps in a dialect, in some non-standard speaker, older speaker who no longer have all their teeth or so on, all this changes the way we speak and all this has a strong influence on the uh, ASR performance. So make sure that we have clean environments, that the situation is comfortable for both for the interviewer and the interviewee. Try not to have the interviewer interfere with the speaker or to reduce this to an absolute minimum and check whether there are any language problems. And my final recommendation is, and that's why I'm wearing this one here, is to use a close talk or a microphone that you can attach to your clothing because this really makes the difference. You remember we had a, an error rate of 60% for the recording done of the British general, and we had about 5% error rate in my web, uh, webinar test. How did I achieve this? Well, I simply used my mobile phone, the built-in recorder, and the headphones that came with the phone. The trick here is to, the microphone is close to the mouth. I was in a standard private, private living room I just switched on the thing and it worked. And 
it gave me this quality signal quality which resulted in a 5.3 error rate in the speech recognition which i think is quite good what's also interesting is that mobile phones are so ubiquitous that people no longer feel disturbed by them they accept them so if you plan to do your recordings think of using a mobile phone and if you can get a lapel microphone that attaches to the color of the interviewee then that's the perfect situation at least for a number of situations we can talk about this later okay so now this was my uh, evangelical part on how to get the optimal signal quality i will now go to the oh portal you've seen this diagram before i'll go on quickly and we've taken the middle part of it and try to put this into a one two three procedure in a web page so once we have a digital recording from tape from a new interview or whatever we try to go through we try to add it to the oh portal check the technical parameters and start the processing. The OH portal is an idea to have a one a single graphical interface to the state of the art processing tools. So we are not providing a number of these tools. We're using external providers especially for speech recognition. Then we have a built-in editor for manual transcription correction. And we have an automatic word alignment, which was effectively uh, developed here at the bus. It's the whole OH portal is a pre-configured workflow. So you put your files in on the left side, and then like a, like a spreadsheet, they go one step after the other through the whole process. You will see where the individual processes are and at the end you can export it or download it to your machine for all the further analysis. Currently we support only a few languages, others are in the pipeline and here's where the authentication is necessary. It's restricted to academic users so if you want to use it you need to have a Clarine account in most cases an EduChrome account is sufficient but Clarine will be able to provide you if you can certify that you're an academic, they will be able to give you an account with which you can use the OH portal. We have, of course, some limitations. It's a technical system, so try to keep your files smaller than 200 megabytes. We restrict ourselves to the WAV audio file format. Generally, we recommend that you split your recordings into smaller, meaningful units. For example, the introduction to the interview, talk about the housing situation at the time, life at home. Every interview has these sections, and if you cut them into or split them into individual uh, files, this will greatly simplify not only the automatic uh, speech recognition, but all the other processing steps as well. For technical manipulation, there's a nice software called Audacity with which you can do a lot of signal processing steps like splitting your stereo files to two single mono files and so on. And finally, don't use special characters in your file names. Things get sent over the web and they get sent from one server to the other, from one machine to the other. And very often it's an apostrophe, a slash, or an umlaut in the file names that stops individual services from working. So stick to the basic characters if possible. Okay, now I will <coughs> sorry, I have a cold. Now I will uh, switch to the screen display and go to the OH portal. Okay, this is what you just saw on the slides, and I will add some files. Oh, I have to go to the, sorry, 
I have to go back one step. Let me explain the basic structure of the page. So up here you have status information. That's the top row. You see the current version. It's It has advanced over what you see in the slides by it's gone from 0.2 to 0.3 because we have added some more features. Here you can access uh, the status reports. So nothing is currently working and you can have some information on how many tasks are running and so on. You get help pages, you get statistics, and this is a button I very much encourage you to use whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a request, use the feedback button. It will send an email to us. It will give us a short summary of the system on which you are using the OH portal, and you can send a comment, a suggestion, and so on. And this will go to directly to the people working on the OH portal. With a little bell, you can switch on so-called desktop notifications. So some process some processes like speech recognition may take some time and you might want to check your mails in between. So switching on these desktop notifications will tell you yet another process has terminated in the OH portal. You can go back to the OH portal and see what's happened. And then we have the settings. And here you can, if you have some files and you don't want to continue with them, simply click on clear all data. Okay, the second row, we have three big processing buttons and we have a status message in between. The bottom at the moment is just a big drop area where you can drop your audio files for processing. Here you see the individual steps. So files have to be uploaded to our server. Then speech recognition will be performed if you click on this little icon. Then manual transcription. So speech recognition will not be perfect. You have the opportunity to go through the results of the ASR. Once you've done this, we assume that you have a perfect transcript and then you can do a word alignment, meaning that for every word in the signal, we calculate where it is. Since originally some of the tools were developed by phoneticians, we also have the information where every single sound is in the signal. And finally, we've added this export a column, making it clear this is where the OH portal ends. Here, all your file information, all the transcripts that we have generated during the process are now available and you can download them to your local machine for further processing. Okay, now I will go to back to add files and I will take the Thompson interview simply because the the speaker is interesting. And I will add another one, namely my test run of the And one more. I will also take the historical recording because this will show you that. ASR doesn't perform too well. OK, now these files are added to the web page. Actually, the whole OH portal runs in your web page in the Google browser. So you don't have to install any software. You just use the Google browser and inside the open window, the entire application runs. Of course, it will send data to uh, the different servers. It will send them to our server at the Institute from which it is passed on, for example, to Google ASR and so on. Now we will click on verify. You will see all the files that have been upload, uh, selected. And this is where it becomes interesting. We have a number of providers for different services, mainly, of course, uh, transcription. So we have German, the languages are listed here. 
It's quite a lot. It's, I told you we have four languages at the moment and we have a number of options for different languages. Then you can go here and have a look at the conditions under which these files are processed. For some projects, probably for quite a number of projects, it will be difficult or not allowed to uh, give your data to some to some non-academic, to some commercial entity, or to have it leave the European Uni Union and so on. So we have a summary of the most important uh, issues here. So in this case, Google, at the moment, we have a deal with Google that the data is not stored after processing, so they do not keep it. And data logging is disabled, so they will not use the data to further improve the service. You can have the look, a look at the official terms and condition, and you can also access the home page of the service. So this is available for all the services that we have here. I will choose Google. And oh, that was not. We have English text, so I have to ch choose English. And I'm interested in the manual transcription, and I will do the word alignment as well. So. I will simply click on OK. If I know that speech recognition is really good, then I might skip this step and live with the 5% error rate. Or if I know that speech recognition is terrible, I will skip speech recognition all the, altogether and simply go to the manual transcription right away. OK. Now I click on Start Processing. And as you can see, the files are being uploaded to our service and speech recognition has started. Here you can see some information on the running process. Again, you can see the terms and conditions. There's not much to see yet. This might take a few minutes. <clears throat> OK. So we have to wait until the first is done. In general, it should be quite quick. The Thompson interview, as we saw before, it doesn't have too much information, but it takes a few sec, it takes a minute or so. In the meantime, I can explain a bit more about the interface. So as I did just before, when I click on or simply put my mouse above on one of these symbols, I get additional information. Something has happened. So speech recognition was successful, incidentally, for the longer files. OK, now it was successful for all the others as well. I can have a look at the results. So I think this is quite an interesting format, the table format. Now you can see it starts at time point zero and goes to 22.5 seconds. And there's some text here from 22.51 till 55.77. There's some more text and so on. So now you get an idea of the text. We can have some other information as well. Let me go to the same one. We can have a look at as raw text. So this is where it goes. You can now start to read the text if you want. You can also download all the text right away. So if you click on this, it will be downloaded to your machine. This is available wherever you see these little green check marks. Now we are in the uh, process of we finished the automatic speech recognition. We now go to the manual transcript. I will take the one by the British General. It's not too good, but it's OK. Now you can see that the editor has opened for the manual transcript. And I will simply give it, start playing it. OK, so we can see there is a transcript. There is some text here. I will place a segment boundary here. 
or I might do it differently. I will, I will simply open this. Okay, so I will add a boundary here and go to the next one. There's something missing, but I would put the boundary here. Okay. Now, back to two so this is where the other speaker said something. So the guy... Okay. Now, back to two so, so the guy writing it down. And this is part where the part where the ASR the automatic speech recognition completely went wrong. So this is the part and whatever the general says, we don't find it here. So this is something we have to do manually. Okay, I could go on and now and do this for the entire file. It will be too long to do this. Just let me point out a few things. We can go back to the individual segments. So I do the final corrections here and starts doesn't need to be. And then there was this. Um, okay, and then we can save this. So that's how we go through the entire file. Since we have a 60% error rate, this means a lot of work for us. This is another view. We can see all the segments that were defined and that were processed, and we can listen to the entire interview one part after the other, either individually or as a text. Okay, so I think you get the idea of what's happening. Although the transcript isn't good, I will send it to the next step, but I will have a look at the other one, which is much better. Again, the editor opens and I can start playing it. Okay, so this seems very straightforward. The quality is very good. So I decide I don't have to correct anything here. I will send it to the server. And now the word alignment is being done. I'll wait until this is finished. I'm not going to use this one because we know the Google uh, speech recognition didn't work very well here. Okay, now it's finished the word alignment. I will click on this and have a look at the text. Okay, it has some minor issues you know. You now see it should be now and some, but there it's okay. And we can have a look and go to the individual segments here and even have a look at words. So actually, this is quite good. Every word is precisely aligned with the signal. Of course, there may be some problems in some place, but in this case, the results were very good. OK, finally, I will go to the Export button and get the option to select the results either as a table or as a plain text file or as a text grid file. I can choose any of these and they, they will be packaged and sent to my machine. Okay, I click on download and there we go. These are the results and I will move them to my to the original folder 
double clicking on them will give me the results of the different steps all in one place. Okay, this was the demo of the uh, OH portal. Now I want to go back to the webinar. Um, Christoph, we have 10 minutes left. Okay, uh, I'm done. The best, uh, yeah, then we... All right. I'm that sorry, means... I... No, no problem. It's very interesting. But I think we have some questions to address. Yes. Um, so there were quite uh, some. Thank you very much for these. Um, there's a first uh, uh, series of questions boiling down to um, how does the ASR deal with accents? Um, uh, and that can be mild and uh, also substantial uh, accents. Um, what would you like to say about that, uh, Christophe? Yes, I can say something. Uh, it depends. We have the problem is when we use commercial uh, recognizers like Google, we don't know what they have been trained on. So you simply have to test it. There is no way of predicting the results. If you listen to, for example, the British general and my recording, I'm a German speaker, so not a native British English speaker, but my recognition results were so much better than the recognition results for the British speaker. There's no really no way of determining or saying it before testing it what the results will be for a given accent. Of course, the closer to the norm and the better the audio quality, probably the results will be much better. But yeah, simply test it with a file. Yes, it means that if the, if the audio, the, <clears throat> the, the acoustics are a bit different from normal speakers. It should be fine. But as soon as you uh, end up with dialect speakers, <clears throat> who can even have uh, different vocabulary and uh, syntax, then uh, yes. ASR, of course, will not work anymore. No. It's, it's a research opportunity. So actually yes. research in uh, ASR is at the moment because of the success of commercial providers. Research is slowing down a little bit, but I think it, these niches where we have dialectal speakers, speakers with disorders or speakers with very specific topics, that's that could be a highly interesting research area. Yes, indeed. Something about uh, the input, um, the input uh, coding of the audio files. I think you mentioned only BAF files are accepted now by the portal. Is there also a limitation on uh, sampling frequency? Uh, no, the in general the uh, external services downsample the signal to 16 kilohertz. So, in order to get as much as you can into the 200 megabytes, I would suggest that you down so uh, downsample the signal to 16 kilohertz. But that's not necessary. It, it will simply give you more, yeah, more signal in the same place on the disk, and. Right. Um, then you said uh, special characters and file names are not allowed. Now, what uh, typically is encountered that um, I see is that spaces are used in the file names. Are these uh, uh, forbidden too, spaces? I would like to forbid them, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but does, does, do you run into errors if there's a space in it the file? It may happen because a lot of work is performed on external servers, so we don't know what they do. In our case, the OH portal can treat them well, but we don't know, for example, what some external provider does with these file names. So it might be a problem. It's nothing we can guarantee. Yes. Um, do you have recording tips for multiple speakers in, um, in a file? Or multiple um, speakers in the scene? Yes, the ideal situation is to have one microphone per speaker on the clothing. And of course, if you have 10 speakers, this would mean 10 microphones. Uh, if you cannot achieve this, then we need discipline among the speakers to have only uh, if only one speaker at the same time. But I know this is a problem. Very often you have these very natural situations which you want to record, but then you cannot do automatic processing. You will have to do it manually. Yes, right. Um, then um, I think you showed us the export formats, export formats of the of the platform. Um, there are questions about the GDPR compliance of the platform. You showed us what the licenses are. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
and uh, this means uh, and, and the um, agreement that you have with uh, with Google. Um, but what happens with the files that are on on the server of the portal? Uh, can people delete them themselves? And if they delete them, are, are they still remaining there and only become invisible for the users, or are, are they really removed? Uh, they are removed. So we keep them only for as long as the process is running or 24 hours at the latest after 24 hours they're deleted so yes. we do not keep track of them this is simply to allow you to restart later on again without uploading the files but in general once we're through with the processing chain uh, we delete the signals and people can also delete them themselves no there's no way of seeing because we do some file renaming uh, on the in on the server because we give them a unique identifier so that several people with the same processing the same file as would be the case today that they get new file num uh, file names uh, yeah so that we can keep them apart yes right and um, what do you think about storage of the interviews on mobile phones um, also is um, because you recommended the iPhone six um, <laughs> in, in terms of again GDPR. Um, clients uh, I'm not recommending the iPhone 6 it's simply to show you that with simple means you can achieve quite something uh, in general they it's of course a professional recording equipment would be much better so if you have a dedicated recorder with this type of microphone I would strongly suggest that you use this but in order to for some reasons it might be better to simply do it on a mobile phone and then of course either you have a dedicated mobile phone that you use like uh, any other recording device or that you have to tell people this is a project mobile phone somebody else might be using it yeah this is basically something we cannot take care of that's what the recording people have to decide and uh, organize yes. um, questions about languages uh, included in the portal uh, greek and african languages uh, mm -hmm. are currently not supported at all the problem is uh, google speech recognition and other speech recognition tools offer a lot of languages but to a very uh, different degrees of quality so we last only last year we tried Swedish and the result was horrible which I hadn't expected uh, but we have a number of tools here so the word alignment for example depends on the system mouse and mouse currently supports 20 languages so any language not in any of the services uh, or to put it other the other way around if files are to go from one end to the other in the OH portal all the tools in between have to support this language and this is at the moment not uh, the case so Google has actually the largest range of languages so it's not the ASR that's the problem but uh, the further the tools further down the line yes and it means that if there are <laughs> good um, ASR engines available for a language we would encourage people to contact us uh, um, to yes. in the uh, portal yes that would be very nice i recently heard about good finnish recognition so perhaps we can put this into the portal and there seems to be very good a very good check one so we're discussing on how we can include it in the oh portal right yes um I think these were um, the questions uh, mainly. There's one question I see by, uh, by George on integration into the European Open Science Cloud of, of, of the tools. Um, I think this is a, a very relevant question, but not quite uh, for, for this uh, hands-on uh, transcription portal. Uh, uh, but I see some reactions have also uh, been entered in the attendance chat. I hope George will be helped with this. And otherwise offline, of course, we can discuss this. Um, then let me see where are we with our presentation. Um, I think um, I will. Oh yes. So um, there are some upcoming events and workshops. They are on this slide. Um, um, I also can mention that there is a, a an event in uh, Leiden in, in, in this month already. Um, this is uh, an event from the European uh, Social Sciences History Conference. Uh, it is 18 to 20 March in Leiden, and it uh, is uh, has a 
uh, I think, three days on uh, oral history. And I think also Christoph uh, will give a, a performance there and, uh, and, and show you more. So this, I, I would like to um, uh, tell you this as well. And there are two more, uh, three more occasions here on which you can further follow us. Um, then I think we come to a conclusion. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Further questions can be put in the chat box. We can also um, answer them uh, offline and later. And um, slides and recordings, as already uh, have been told, uh, they will be sent to all registered delegates. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to uh, give this uh, webinar. Yeah, and sorry for being so long, but sometimes I get overwhelmed but <laughs> by what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.